As we continue our discussion on the introductory principles of pharmacology, we are now going to talk about the duration of drug action. So how does the drug action take place and what are the tenets of that? So the disassociation of a drug from the receptor can automatically terminate the effect. So if we have a uh, membrane here and then we have uh, a receptor and if a drug comes on here it will produce an effect inside the cell and this is the cell membrane and then as soon as that drug or hormone or ligand or whatever comes off of that receptor well then that's going to terminate the signal. And so that that's one way that the duration of a drug action can take take place. So another is drugs that bind covalently to the receptor site. So if there is a receptor here and it kind of bonds there and it's like super glue permanently stuck there, then that's kind of a different story. And the effect may persist until the drug receptor complex is destroyed. Okay. So, you know, if this is a cell membrane and that's covalently bond, well this signal is going to keep sending, you know, that's this trigger here is going to keep sending signals down, 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 down into the cell saying, you know, I need you guys to do this, whatever, whatever this pathway is designed to do. Well, if it's covalently bonded, it's not just going to pop off. What happens is it goes through endocytosis and this whole complex, you know, become, it comes inside the cell and then it's chewed up. And so new receptors or enzymes are synthesized and that might take, it's called de novo synthesis, and that might uh, take a little while for that to be synthesized and so a new receptor be placed on the cell surface. So many receptor effector systems incorporate desensitization mechanisms from preventing excessive activation. And we'll talk, some of, uh, talk about some of these desensitization mechanisms when we talk about G-coupled proteins. So a drug must selectively bind to a functional receptor. It has to go through some pathways and it has to find a, the right receptor that it goes to and it must selectively bind to that uh, functional receptor and it just can't bind anywhere into the body for it to be effective. And it must change the function either by inhibiting the pathway or by exacerbating or turning it on. So those are some of the principles of more of a pharma, pharmodynamic type of a thing, have how the drug might affect your body. Now we turn to pharma, pharmacokinetic principles and that's more of how your body reacts to the drugs. So what is a prodrug? A prodrug is a, an inactive precursor chemical that is readily absorbed and distributed and then it is converted into an active drug by a biological process inside the body. That's a prodrug. So, you know, a lot of times is when we, you know, ingest, for example, you know, when people take their meds, it's a, usually an inactive precursor and then it you know gets modified through the intestines and through the gastrointestinal tract and gets absorbed and distributed and then sometimes it gets converted into the active form of the drug by some biological process. So what is the path of the drug? So first of all the drug needs to be go through absorption into the blood, blood from the site of administration. So it can be IV, it can be IM, intramuscular, Ooh, that's too many M's, too many humps, sorry. It can be IV through the, the venous system injected into the veins, it can be you know, a shot in the butt for example, intramuscular or in the arm, it could be oral, it could be in through the rectum, it can, there's several, you know, it could be just under the skin, there's several sites of administration that drugs can happen. So first of all, the path of the drug involves, uh, number one, absorption. Okay, that leads to distribution. 
So then the drug, once it gets inside your body, needs to get distributed to the sites of action. And how that happens is through permeation, through uh, various barriers. So, you know, if this is, you know, some somebody's mouth has to go down the esophagus into the stomach here, and then has to go through the GI tract, then it has to get absorbed into the hepatic portal system, and then it kind of goes up, the liver filters it, this is the liver, has to get filtered by the liver, and then it can go through the whole circulation. Or, it can, if it's in an IV, you just bypass all that and go right into the venous system. Or if it's in the muscle, it doesn't have to go through the gut. So, the engineering of drugs has to take into account how it's going to be activated, or how it's going to enter the body, and then what barriers it has to pass through before it reaches its target tissues. And so it needs to be absorbed, distributed, and how it gets distributed is via permeation of the various barriers. And finally, the drug is going to be eliminated at some rate. At some rate it's going to be eliminated because it's foreign to the body. The body's not going to let it stick around unless it convalently bonds like up in up in this example but then even if it covalently bonds to a receptor or whatever the body will endocytose that and it will cut off that pathway but it's going to be eliminated at a reasonable rate by metabolic inactivation so drug permeation proceeds um, happens through several mechanisms one is the passive diffusion in an aqueous or lipid medium and the second is active processes that they play a role in the movement of of many drugs and specifically large molecules or really charged molecules that are hard to diffuse past uh, lipid bilayers through cells and walls and stuff. So aqueous diffusion uh, occurs within the larger aqueous compartments of the body and lipid diffusion um, is the most important limiting factor of how drugs permeate because of the large number of lipid barriers that separate all the compartments of the body. So if this is a lumen, you know, a lumen is just one of your organs, so let's say this is the GI tract. So you got all these molecules here, and these are all mechanisms, A, B, C, and D, of how these uh, drugs can pass into the interstitium or into the extracellular matrix or into the blood into the interstitium one is through pass passive aqueous channels that are kind of in between the cells so here's you know there's a cell here and a cell here and usually they're kind of connected together but you know some certain types of molecules that have certain characteristics can go right through Passive lipid membranes, um, if it's a nonpolar, kind of a lipid soluble type drug, it can pass right through the membrane, like steroids, for example, do that. And then it could be uh, more active by having ports. And they can either say, like, if sodium is right here, a drug could kind of, uh, or sodium actually is probably be on the outside, rather. But if this drug attached to a sodium, it could kind of sit, there's a sim porter, it kind of both of them kind of get chugged into the cell here and then spit out on the other side, and then vice versa. If it wanted to come from the interstitium into the lumen and get excreted, it'd have to go in the reverse direction. And the other one is endocytosis and exocytosis. That's a good way to take a chunk of. Uh, spay or fluid here and whatever's inside you engulf it and then you deal with it and then at the same token to get stuff out of the cell you just inside a lysosome or in some kind of bubble here it just kind of fuses with the uh, cell membrane and then the contents leak out that's endocytosis is coming in and exocytosis is spitting out so ionization of weak acids and weak bases the henderson hasselbach equation now, I don't want you to have any, you know, psychiatric 
uh, convulsions or everything by looking at this Henry Hasselbach equation if you didn't like it in chemistry. We're not going to figure out the concentration of the acid and its conjugate base um, through the pH, but just the equation helps understand the concentration of this base and this acid. And if you're an engineer, a chemical engineer or a pharmacist, you might have to use this. But for the most part, we just need to understand conceptually what it, what it means. So here is the chemical formula of neutral aspirin. All right. So the conjugate base of this neutral asp aspirin is this molecule here. This is uh, an anion and then you have the proton here. Now why this is important is because of the elimination of drugs through the nephron. So these are the cells of the nephron and you have the interstitium at a, at a pH of 7.4 and your, your urine is a pH of 6. So the, P, the pH is actually lower in the urine than the interstitium. Why? And this is important. So say you wanted to secrete this molecule here. All right. Well, if you add a proton to it, it becomes, you know, an N plus. It has an extra proton, so there's a positive charge associated with this molecule. Well, this positive charge is going to make this molecule bounce off this the cells of a nephron because it's charge it's charged. It's not going to be able to go through this barrier. It could undergo endocytosis or exocytosis, but that would take a really long time. You just want this uh, byproduct or this drug to be eliminated, just naturally diffuse over. So that's what happens is in this pH, this Henry Hasselbach equation, we can know the concentrations of the drugs and understand the biochemistry and so what you want is that this form right here, where it's a non-charged particle, it might just diffuse through lipid diffusion right across the cells of the nephron. And once you get it inside the urine, you don't want it to diffuse back out. You don't want this. So what you want is you want to add a proton to this molecule here, and then the molecule becomes charged, and then it won't it will bounce off the wall. It won't diffuse back over into the interstitium. So this is a way that ionization of weak acids and weak bases can happen so that drugs can be eliminated from your body through this kind of chemistry, if you will. So here's a case study. You can um, just read this and see if you can figure out why the patient was given ammonium chloride. So pause the video, read it, and I'm going to show the answer here in a few seconds. All right, here's the answer. And it just happened to be that the answer is relative of what we just described. So there's a case study. All right, we'll see you in the next video.